Hello, this is Kevin Thompson. I'd like to welcome you to, you to the Davis McGrath LLC IP webinar series for December 12th, 2012. Uh, 12, 12, 12. Uh, today we are going to be talking about IP rights enforcement in social media. Uh, today we're going to be going for about 30 minutes. Uh, the recording and slides will be posted at the address shown on your screen, which is blog.debismograph.com forward slash webinars, where you can also sign up for our webinar mailing list. Uh, for those of you who need Illinois MCLE credit, uh, if you haven't already done so as part of the registration process, uh, please send me your name and ARDC number. For those of you watching the recording and you want Illinois MCLE credit, uh, please send me your name, ARDC number, and uh, uh, when you viewed the webinar. Our next webinar is going to be coming up on January 16th, 2012 on the topic of trademarks and the likelihood of confusion. So today uh, we're going to be covering Facebook, Twitter, and some other uh, social media sites. Uh, we're going to talk about some general enforcement considerations when it comes to taking action against uh, uh, people using social media. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the DMCA and its applicability under copyright law. We're going to talk a little bit about trademark, and then we're going to talk about some other regulations as well that, that can affect uh, the use of social media. So just in general, uh, we're going to start by going through um, the, the particular um, uh, sites that, uh, that are quite popular. We'll start with Facebook. I, I should note that those of you with questions, at any point, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and ask your question using the webinar software. Uh, we'll also have a question and answer section at the end, uh, but please feel free to, uh, to ask a question throughout if, if uh, you know, something comes up and you feel the need to do so. Um, so Facebook uh, is certainly one of the most popular social media sites currently. Uh, there's a personal profile that uh, a user can create and also a page uh, which uh, can be um, an organization or a group or, or even also um, somebody could set up a fan page uh, for something that they're in enamored with. Um, the showing on your screen is the uh, uh, page for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, where the, the information about the university, photos, it, you know, uh, that type of information. They've got a wall in which uh, they share information and uh, people can post, uh, you know, questions and things about the university there as well. Um, and uh, it is a, um, so certainly a place where, where um, if a, company comes comes across a, a page that was not created by them uh, so certainly um, that they, they might want to reach out to Facebook and uh, and see what that uh, what the actions they can take about it um, but we'll talk about more about those types of enforcement actions uh, later on in the webinar purpose of this uh, just to introduce the general topic for those of you who may not be familiar with each general site Uh, Twitter is uh, a social networking site involving uh, short 140-character uh, messages that go back and forth. Uh, you have a, a public profile, uh, which is, is tied to your username, uh, which lists all your tweets. Um, and I uh, should mention that there's a difference between a public tweet and a private direct message. Um, Generally, direct messages will not show up uh, in in public. But if you make a mistake and and uh, in in the, the formatting of something, it it uh, um, will be uh, it will be made public if if you make a mistake. Um, the uh, other thing about them is to keep in, real, in mind that um, just because you may uh, send something to someone or, or reference someone uh, in a tweet, uh, you might think you're just having a correspondence back and forth between one and one and another. Um, and uh, in actuality, uh, every tweet that's a public tweet is is truly public. It goes out into the main uh, Twitter feed and uh, you know can be searched or, or accessed by by any user. Uh, businesses are also taken advantage of, of Twitter by using uh, a system called promoted tweets, uh, which relates to uh, the um, uh, use of um, um, 
a, a tweet relating to a particular topic. Somebody might buy it by the advertising keyword. Um, you know, let's say uh, uh, since we were talking about UW Madison in the prior page, let's say UW Madison, you know, takes um, a promoted tweet on on that, that particular topic. So every time somebody tweets using that hashtag, a promoted tweet might might appear in their Twitter stream, and um, that they would see using their Twitter clients. Um, so uh, Twitter pages could, could be created by uh, the um, uh, an actual brand, um, you know, the, the brand could create it, but but it could also could be um, something created by a, a fan as well. And so that's another instance where, um, uh, you know, a company coming across a, a page that was created by a fan that isn't necessarily the, the company page uh, certainly might want to take action. Uh, LinkedIn. Is is another uh, people think of it more as a like a, a resume type type site or or profile type site, but there's lots of activity in the message boards, uh, as well as there is a, a a business page that can be created by a um, uh, by, by by a company. Uh, if they've got uh, more than two people at a particular company. Uh, LinkedIn automatically creates a, a company page uh, with information about that company, and um, it uh, you know should, should be claimed by by a by a person at the company as a, as a way of, um, of of sort of controlling that social media presence there. A uh, Foursquare is a is a, a social uh, game almost uh, using people using their mobile phones uh, can check in uh, when they're geographically near particular locations. Uh, businesses can offer specials um, in which um, like when you're near a particular place and you check in, uh, you know, that you go to your local Walgreens uh, drugstore and you check in at Walgreens, you might see a, a special on a, a discount on a particular item. If you show the screen to the people at the checkout, uh, they'll give you that discount. Um, there is um, uh, plenty of, of places where, though the the, uh, the the check in is something that was created by a user uh, and not necessarily created by the business, and so um, it's something that a, a a company might certainly want to take advantage of is to see just exactly whether or not a, a somebody's created a uh, Foursquare check in for their particular business, and if so, they might want to to claim it and um, uh, you know, take control of it, and so they can manage uh, just how it's, it's used. Yelp um, is certainly a popular one these days. Uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, site uh, with r reviews of, of local businesses. Um, the most uh, common use of it is to find a restaurant, uh, but there's other uh, service categories. For example, lawyers. Uh, I'm showing on the screen uh, the uh, review. Uh, for um, the, um, the the law firm here, Davis McGrath, um, and uh, you know information on Yelp about it. Um, uh, but uh, the most most common thing that uh, Yelp is in the news for today is is people leaving false reviews. Uh, like people will leave um, um, a, a bad review for for a competitor or uh, or other similar action and uh, you know those are generally addressed uh, by um, you know defamation or uh, libel or, or other such such laws uh, but it could also you know come up um, you know there could be a, a trademark infringement as well too Pinterest um, it's, it seems to come up most often in terms of copyright concerns um, it's a place where, where people see something that they like um, they can uh, pin it uh, to their uh, their Pinterest board, and um, if you're just looking at the, the home screen here, there's people that have posted recipes, people posted a picture of their dog, um, uh, you know, all you know, people post picture pictures of products, uh, home decorating ideas, um, all sorts of things. Um, but in particular, it seems to cause most concerns. Uh, for example, on the, uh, just right there on the home page was a picture of um, artwork on the uh, lower lower right of um, um, artwork from a particular game. Um, 
of a sort of a fantasy game, and uh, you know that artwork is uh, reminiscent of that, and um, you know that certainly could could potentially be a copyright concern for uh, the uh, for the artist or copyright owner of that that particular work. So. Um, uh, we're going to spend a lot of the rest of our time talking about uh, general types of enforcement considerations and and um, uh, things that uh, companies might want to consider. Uh, we're going to for for just general strategy. We're going to talk first about what's called the Streisand effect. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, fair use under copyright, um, nominative fair use of trademarks, and uh, other public attention to enforcement efforts, uh, which can be brought to bear again since this is social media. Uh, people can use that same social media to bring attention to the fact that enforcement is uh, is underway against them, and um, you know well, what can be done. So first, uh, we're going to be talking about the Streisand effect. Um, for those of you who don't know, in 2003, uh, the singer Barbara Streisand and actress Barbara Streisand had uh, put together uh, a lawsuit uh, complaining about a photograph, in fact this particular photograph that appeared online, um, a, a um, photographer had uh, posted uh, thousands of pictures of the California coastline and one of the pictures inadvertently is a picture of Barbara Streisand's house which is the uh, center, uh, the largest state there in the center. And um, so she sued for uh, right of publicity concerns. Well, before for her lawsuit, it was discovered that only a grand total of six people had ever accessed that image, and two of which were her lawyers. So there were only four other people in the world that had seen it. As a result of filing the lawsuit, in the first month, over 420,000 people saw the picture of her house. Um, and so the Streisand effect is 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 so simply by by bringing the lawsuit, you're, you're bringing attention to something um, that otherwise might possibly have been private if you had just let it let it go. Um, you know, if Barbara Streisand hadn't filed the lawsuit, I don't know how anybody really would have sat down to figure out uh, which which one of the thousands of, of pictures posted online uh, was her house, and. Um, and so uh, a lot of ridicule for, for Barbara Streisand for, for bringing this lawsuit. Um, um, you know, it, you know the public media and so forth, um, you know, took advantage. I think she was even parodied on South Park uh, for, for having brought this lawsuit. Um, and um, uh, so the Streisand effect is in, there's been other examples of this as well, of, of you know, simply by, by bringing the lawsuit, you know, you've, you've brought attention to something, you know, that might otherwise have, have been ignored or, 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 you know, smoothed over very quickly um, by, uh, uh, you know, by, 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 this, by this type of action. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is fair use, uh, something that should be um, on the foremost concern of, of uh, uh, someone bringing a copyright claim is whether or not there's a, any potential fair use uh, of that action. Um, and one of the major reasons you want to do that is, is you want to be able to say that you've, you've brought this, this action in, in good faith. Um, if it's, uh, sometimes if it's later shown that uh, a uh, uh, person it does have a fair use claim, and uh, you didn't consider it. You know, when you you brought uh, your, your 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 copyright action against them, um, you know, you potentially could could be liable uh, for for you know their costs and so forth, um, depending on the nature of the action. Um, so just in general, well, we've talked about fair use in in particular. In fact, uh, one of our we've got a whole uh, prior webinar. If you want to go to our uh, our webinar archives and look at it, a, a whole webinar just on the topic of fair use. Um, but just for very briefly, uh, fair use involves a four-factor test. You have to look at the purpose and character of the use. Uh, you know, is this a, uh, a commercial or non-commercial use? Um, well, you know, what's the nature of the copyrighted work itself? Is this a, uh, um, a literary work? Is this uh, something that, uh, um, like a something that was out there for public discussion, you know, what, what, what just exactly what was it. Uh, you have to look at the amount and substantiality of the portion that was used. Um, so if they've taken, uh, 
you know, the heart of it, um, that, that certainly could be, you know, infringement. It won't be fair use if you take, um, you know, the one section of the book that everybody wants to read. Uh, but it might be fair use um, if you, um, you know, merely summarize or, um, or just reference something. Um, and then the last is the uh, effect of the use on the market for the copyrighted work. And this to look at is, is will, will the, um, uh, the, the, the item that's claiming fair use uh, be um, a replacement for the original, like for people buy this instead, or would it still, uh, you know, people would still want to buy the original. Um, so that's, that's, those are the four factors. And I, I kept this reminder in here. It's just sure, it's important to note that fair use is a defense to a claim of infringement. Um, so if it's ever found not to be a fair use, you're on the hook for the infringement that's, that's, that's broad. Um, next, turning to the area of trademarks, uh, it's important to consider nominative fair use as well. Um, this often comes up in the case where like a distributor of a product will advertise, for example, um, a, a car dealership might, might advertise that they sell Ford cars. Um, and um, the question is whether or not, um, you know, like if they're just a, a regular dealership that's not a, normally affiliated with Ford, um, you know, if, if they used uh, the Ford logo or the Ford trademark in such a way to imply sponsorship or affiliation, you know, that could be a problem. Um, and uh, so there's a, a test that goes into whether or not uh, uh, the, the, the person using using the trademark is, is entitled to do so if they use it to, to identify the name or, or, or the product or the source, you know, the particular goods that are being sold as an example. Um, and so there's a, a three-factor test that's, that's generally looked at. The first is uh, whether or not the product or service could be readily identified without using the trademark. So, um, you know, if they, uh, you know, if you had no choice but to use the trademark to identify the product. Um, second would be whether or not the user used only as much of the mark as necessary for the identification. Um, this often comes up when a, a a uh, company has a, a logo and they've also, you know, got the company name. Uh, so if you use the company name to identify the source um, as well as the logo, um, that could be a problem if, uh, you know, the, it was not necessary to use the logo. If you use the logo, it might look like more sponsorship or affiliation than, than, than it tr truly is. Um, but if you merely just identify the name of, of it, um, you know, just Ford and not the Blue Oval logo for Ford, um, then that uh, you know might might be better off uh, than than using using both or, or just the logo, um, and then the the final uh, part of the test is whether or not the user uh, doesn't do anything to support su to suggest sponsorship or endorsement by the trademark holder. Again, uh, it's very fact specific, but uh, you, you know the test is is whether or not uh, somebody just looking at it would would believe that uh, the trademark holder was uh, somehow affiliated with uh, the person using the, the trademark in a, or trying to use it in a nominative fashion. So that's important consideration. Um, social media, uh, you know, can be used by all sorts of people, uh, such as, um, you know, distributors or resellers of, of goods. And so um, if somebody's using a trademark in so, such a way, to identify the source of the goods that they're selling, uh, then that certainly, you know, could potentially be a claim for nominative fair use. Um, the last thing I wanted to say about uh, uh, enforcement considerations is, uh, you know, sometimes there's public attention brought to enforcement efforts. Um, uh, there's a, but for a long time, there's been a, a website out called Chilling Effects, uh, which publishes uh, cease and desist letters that are sent out um, and so this isn't specific to uh, online social media, but it, but it's 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 out there, and should, people should be aware that uh, you know this site exists. And so um, keep keep in mind that even though you're sending someone a, a cease and desist letter, you know there's always the chance that uh, the um, you know person could post it or send it to the people who run this particular website, and it it could be be posted 
or you know they could use social media themselves to, to post it um, and um, so it's, it's out there it should be a consideration um, especially if it's uh, something you'd be concerned if it ever came out that uh, you know you were taking action against uh, you know some small individual or something like that um, the next one I wanted to mention is a very recent uh, thing that just happened just this year. Um, there's an online comic called The Oatmeal, and it had complained uh, publicly about uh, some in, uh, copyright infringement that it claimed was going on with a website called Funny Junk. And um, it, it got to the point where Funny Junk uh, had its lawyer, uh, Charles Carrion, send a um, cease and desist letter to The Oatmeal um, you know, claiming uh, disparagement and you know lots of other you know potential causes of action and demanding uh, twenty thousand uh, dollars to be paid. Um, well, the oatmeal, being what it is, uh, sort of this uh, edgy uh, web comic. Uh, it's certainly not for the faint of heart. Um, you know, there there are plenty of of the oatmeal comics that are are some would consider vulgar, uh, but plenty of which you know would be considered quite funny uh, by most people. Uh, but just keep that in mind is, is you know not everything in there is uh, necessarily safe for work um, well the oatmeal posted um, you know this this letter from from the the funny junks lawyer and uh, and said uh, essentially refused to pay and said that uh, uh, instead of paying twenty thousand dollars to the funny junk what it would do is it would do a uh, uh, fundraiser uh, for charity in which uh, they would try to raise twenty thousand dollars, take a picture of the twenty thousand dollars raised for charity before it was sent to them, and then send uh, the lawyer a picture of the money along with a, uh, a sort of vulgar uh, cartoon written by the oatmeal, um, in which um, the uh, one of the persons depicted in the cartoon was uh, purported to be Charles Carrion's mother, uh, essentially. Um, uh, in treating with a bear <laughs> for 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 the bear to love them um, and um, and the the, the charities chosen were for uh, uh, wildlife uh, the the, the uh, one foundation to support bears another one against cancer um, and so it was uh, announced as the the bear uh, bear love good cancer bad fundraiser and um, they raised far more than the twenty thousand I believe it was closer to two hundred thousand and um, uh, you know, so it got a lot of web publicity, far far more than I think uh, the oatmeal or funny junk ever thought would happen. Um, and um, you know, there's a, a bit of an ongoing dispute still over Charles Carrion um, and his involvement. He sort of has a, a side story here. I don't want to spend too much time. We could probably spend a half an hour just talking about this particular incident, just in general. Um, but uh, you know, it's essentially, um, you know, when you send somebody a cease and desist letter for online, and, and the, these people are social media savvy, you can certainly expect uh, that public attention is going to be brought to your enforcement efforts in, in ways you possibly had never imagined. And uh, so, certainly, I think the funny junk never imagined uh, that uh, they'd be the subject of ridicule for, um, you know, having, you know, tried to, you know, stop. You know these statements made about their alleged uh, copyright infringement activities, um, and now um, you know the oatmeal by by taking this to social media, and uh, you know making a public issue out of uh, out of you know the funny junks behavior, um, it's, it's certainly uh, you know elevated it to a different level than I think anybody had you know potentially considered. And I think people are going to be looking back and, and studying this particular dispute to see, um, you know, whether any lessons can be learned from it. Um, in general, I, I would say just just keep this in mind. If if you're if you're, you know, uh, going against somebody that is social media savvy, uh, you can certainly expect uh, you know the full power of social media to be brought against you. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is copyright considerations. Um, you know, we've talked about this in, in prior webinars, but uh, there's a safe harbor that's given to those who register uh, for um, copyright uh, protection through the Copyright Office, and they've also got a notice and takedown policy. So just very briefly, we're going to talk about um, some of that here. Um, 
the DMCA is uh, uh, Section 512 of the Copyright Act, uh, which provides, uh, again, we've talked about this, uh, the safe harbor that required to designate an agent for service of these notices. Um, they uh, qualify for this protection. They must not have actual knowledge of the infringement, uh, no direct financial benefit, and must act quickly to remove the infringement once there is notice. And uh, this is a, certainly a, a very common avenue here. Um, so in order to, to give a DMCA notice, you've got to have a physical electronic signature. You've got to identify the copyrighted work, identify um, the web, web material specifically online is claimed to be infringing. You've got to protect, provide as much information as you can about uh, uh, where where the work is and where it can be found. Um, contact information for the complainants and a statement that you've got a good faith belief that the work is not authorized. Um, again, this is where um, if the, the the person has a fair use claim, um, uh, they um, you know you could be in trouble for for making this 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 complaint if um, if you haven't considered uh, the fair use elements here. And um, uh, you know, if, if you've got a good good faith belief that that, that fair use does not apply, that that's that's okay. Uh, but if the, if you do have a good faith belief that fair use might apply, then you really shouldn't be sending this type of a notice. Um, just generally, uh, very quickly, the the takedown procedure it provides for notice given to the online service provider. That person takes the material down and uh, notifies the user who uploaded the material. Um, if taken down wrongly, um, that person who receives the notice can provide a counter notice, uh, which is very similar to the other notice. Um, and um, uh, it takes about 10 to 14 days, but if, if no suit is filed, uh, then the material should be put back up online uh, by the online service provider. Um, you know, when, when would somebody actually commit and submit this counter notice? Uh, fair use, as we've talked about before, uh, commentary on... Um, on it, uh, news commentary or, or other co forms of commentary. Um, you know, notifier is not the owner or agent for the allegedly infringing work. This could be a, a thing, or or even misidentification. Um, you know, what's happened online uh, a lot is uh, these uh, robots that uh, go out searching for uh, material that uh, um, has, uh, you know, this element. To it, like a, a particular hash that uh, that that can be uh, matched up online to the particular work, and uh, what ends up happening is, uh, like for example, a news organization will show um, a clip of something as uh, you know part of the part of their news program, and then these automated bots will will look at it and um, sometimes go after uh, the original source of of the video. Uh, claiming that they're infringing the copyright of the news program, just just, just it's a pure uh, fault of the fact that it's it's just an automated system that's that's doing this checking, and it doesn't know any better um, that it's going against the original, and so um, I would strongly caution people using you know that type of automated bot system to have some sort of a check in place before you know actually submitting um, you know the complaint because um, you know you could be trying to take down something that truly is authorized if it's truly a case of misidentification. Um, so I just want to provide an example here. Uh, Twitter's terms of service, uh, the, their copyright policy, this is the person you'd send uh, the notice to. They've got a copyright agent, they've provided an address, and they've got a special address, uh, copyright at twitter.com, where you can send uh, the takedown notice um, if, if it's there. Um, there are other avenues. Um, Informal processes, uh, these vary from provider to provider. Uh, some are formal pr processes, like the one I just mentioned involving the DMCA, but uh, there's plenty of other uh, informal ones. Uh, you know, Twitter is certainly willing to work with people for trademark concerns, like we'll be talking about in a second. Um, so username considerations, um, you know, the usernames on these particular sites um, you know, can raise trademark concerns and also can raise uh, right of publicity concerns for personal names. Um, right of publicity concerns, for example, is a case of um, um, Yankees manager Tony La Russa. He claimed um, trademark infringement, cyber squatting, violation of the right of publicity for um, a Twitter handle that was, uh, I believe it was at La Russa. Um, and uh, very shortly after his uh, case was filed, um, 
the case was settled and the username was uh, transferred to Larusa. So it's um, it just wasn't adjudicated, but uh, it was certainly resolved. Um, these days, there really truly is a better informal process in place at Twitter uh, for handling these types of concerns. But they've also got a, a, a way as well that you can complain about uh, trademark infringement as well. Um, here's another case. Um, where they sued for trademark infringement for the registered trademark 1OK Inc. Uh, the 1OK is a registered trademark, um, and so they sued Twitter for not taking proper actions to turn the uh, the, the the username over to them. Um, in this case, um, the case was dismissed. I believe one day ever it was filed and the username transferred. It uh, you know it was very very quickly resolved, and uh, once again Twitter has improved its its processes since this particular case. Um, and I want to talk a little about some other concerns. Um, uh, if, when you're dealing with uh, things that are online, uh, for you know, especially companies' use of social media, uh, you want to be concerned about bias. Um, the FTC has, uh, you know, ramped up its testimonial and endorsement guidelines, uh, which uh, very um, I would strongly suggest people take a look at uh, what what has as a result of this is a, a lot of people that uh, were uh, paid bloggers for a particular site in which they would be doing reviews of of goods and so forth. Um, you know now have to post publicly uh, and disclose the fact that they may have not paid for the the good that they're reviewing. They may have been provided by the company, um, and so um, you know it shows potential bias in that review. Um, and uh, so, so that's a, I think that's just in general a good thing, but it's 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 something to keep in mind, um, especially when you're dealing with um, some some companies' use of social media involves um, uh, you know trying to make something go viral, and that turns out to be like a stunt or a publicity stunt for a particular company, and it it never seems to end well for for the for the company that that's trying to do that. Um, you know, when it comes out that uh, you know this isn't really a you know Joe Schmo uh, who decided to uh, do a dance through through Walmart, um, you know, was actually a, a paid representative from Walmart. It was a produced video that was you know done for um, you know for promotional purposes by Walmart. You know, would just to give it just a hypothetical example there uh, would uh, you know. Look, look badly if if it ever came out that you know this wasn't disclosed. So um, that's certainly something to keep in mind. Um, so just in general, just uh, some best practices. Uh, I think companies should register on the sites on which uh, you know they're needed. I don't think they should register everywhere, but uh, I think companies should keep in mind is you know where their potential user base is or or um, where the customers are. Uh, that's certainly a place to, to take a look at and you know see whether or not you can you know interact with people there. Um, you should monitor these social media sites, um, see what goes on there. Uh, but most of all, you should, you should be active. Um, you know, companies um, you know should uh, be uh, you know capable of uh, interaction uh, with uh, people there. Uh, you should determine a plan of action. Uh, for for this type of, of thing, um, it should be a good thing to keep in mind when you're when you're starting up uh, use a particular social media site. Uh, to, you know what, uh, know ahead of time what uh, your resources are. You know what you know. How do I submit a trademark claim? How do I submit a copyright claim? Um, and so you you know what your your avenues of contact are because um, you, you you may need to act quickly in a particular case, and so it'd be a good idea to. You know, know ahead of time. You know what those what those contact people are and, and how to make those contacts. Um, and then it should be a good idea for for companies that are involved in social media to have a policy uh, for how that social media is used. Um, you know, so that uh, you know perhaps you know like um, people stay on message and uh, don't go into personal things using the corporate account, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just just generally just a good idea. So um, this is probably a good point to ask whether or not uh, people have any questions. I know one came in, so I, I should say that those of you watching the webinar uh, the recording, uh, please feel free to ask your questions through uh, sending them either by phone or, or by email. Um, and those of you who are watching the webinar, um, 
please feel free to submit your questions in. I'll uh, get to the first question here in just a second. James has a good question about what about copyright concerns from uh, printing carry-on's letter. Um, that's certainly a, a, a good concern. Um, essentially, the question is uh, involving the fact that uh, carry-on likely had copyright in his uh, in his letter uh, that was sent uh, to um, the oatmeal and uh, and was then. Uh, published by the oatmeal and ridiculed, um, and uh, so there certainly are you know, potential copyright concerns uh, there. Um, I, I still think, though, that uh, you know when when you send uh, a cease and desist letter out, um, you know you can expect uh, the the normal uh, you know consequences when it comes from that is uh, you can certainly ex expect it to be an, an exhibit in a in a later lawsuit. Um, you know, you can expect uh, the, um, you know, potentially it might be posted, um, especially these days. I, I think you can certainly expect those types of, of actions. Um, so I think, um, you know, those particular copyright concerns are um, sort of mooted, uh, you know, essentially um, it could be almost a fair use in the sense that, uh, um, uh, you know the oatmeal was commenting and you know making commentary on the the cease and desist letter um you know by by publishing it um admittedly um you know that that's not a perfect answer but it but it's a certainly you know one one potential you know way to analyze that issue um and uh you know by no means uh you know are we trying to get into a a a, a, a thorough discussion of that issue like i said uh, we could spend a, a full you know, half an hour. In fact, well, we may at some point uh, just talking about this particular case and, and its implications once it's finally wound its way through the court system. Um, there still is a lawsuit involving uh, uh, Carry On and um, some alleged uh, defamatory statements that were published to a website about him. Uh, so that's certainly still, you know, weaving its way through the court system. It would be interesting to see how that turns out in the end uh, before we, we properly talk about this subject again. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, are there any other questions? Well, if there's no further questions, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, as a reminder, our next webinar is coming up on January 16th, 2013. Oh, I forgot to change that on the slide. It's January 16th, 2013, on the topic of trademarks and the likelihood of confusion, uh, which will be posted, uh, the announcement will be posted on the address on your screen, which is blog at davisbrookcraft.com forward slash webinars. Uh, once again, um, uh, for those of you watching the recording and needing MCLE credit, uh, please um, uh, provide me with your name and ARDC number and uh, how you watched uh, the recording. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Have a great day.